Bonjour, agus chia div. Welcome to The Irish in Canada, the podcast exploring the histories and legacies of Irish immigrants and their Canadian descendants. I'm your host, Jane McGaughy. This is episode number four, Orange Beginnings. Last time on The Irish in Canada, we explored the establishment of Gros Isle as a key lieu de mémoire for Irish immigrants and their descendants across North America, and the important role the island has played in Irish-Canadian stories since the 1830s. The 1830s were a key decade for the Irish in both Upper and Lower Canada, modern-day Ontario and Quebec. Today we're going to discuss one of the most, if not the most, significant Irish contribution to Canadian society in the 19th century, which officially began on Friday, January 1st, 1830, the Orange Order. Orangemen are going to be with us for a while in this podcast, for most of it, actually. To use a favorite, if tired, cliche, you couldn't swing a dead cat without hitting an Orangeman in 19th century Canada. But what was the Orange Order? And how could a movement that once completely dominated politics and society in English Canada for over a century now barely be remembered? The Orange Order was, and continues to be, a fraternal society established in 1795 in County Armagh following the Battle of the Diamond. Named in honour of William of Orange and his victory over the Catholic Stuart King James II at the Battle of the Boyne in 1690, the society dedicated itself to Protestantism, small-c conservatism, and loyalty to the British crown. Its opponents saw it as a sectarian, triumphalist, divisive, and often violent element in society, which is certainly the way that the Canadian colonial establishment thought of Orangemen. Orangeism in Canada began much earlier than the 1830s. There's evidence of lodge meetings in Montreal as early as 1800, and it spread again when Irish soldiers arrived to fight in the War of 1812. Up until 1830, however, Orange Lodges were predominantly local in nature and outlook, rather than having broader connections. The Canadian roots of Orangeism can, in part, be traced to the United Irishmen's Rising of 1798 and the sectarian violence that erupted in County Wexford during and after that uprising. It was particularly gruesome and had long-term ramifications for how Orangeism was perceived in Ireland and, eventually, in Canada. John Hunter Gowan led a yeomanry corps in County Wexford, known locally as the Black Mob. After the Rising had been crushed at Vinegar Hill in June 1798, Gowan was among many local gentry who oversaw loyalist atrocities against the defeated United Irishmen, and any local Catholics who crossed them. The black mob gained notoriety for its terror campaigns in the area around Gorey and County Wexford. Hunter Gowan was described by United Irishman Miles Byrne as a monster and a low fellow who committed cruelties and cold-blooded murders. In 1801, he was charged with 34 individual counts of murder, but had his trial dismissed when a key witness failed to appear before the magistrates. The 1798 Rising had global consequences, scattering both United Irishmen and ultra-loyalists throughout the Atlantic world and beyond. Veterans from both sides of the conflict helped to popularize the image of the wild Irishmen and the imaginations of their new host societies. And despite the defeat of the United Irishmen in Wexford, Protestants in South Leinster began leaving Ireland in massive numbers in the following decades, what I call the Wexford Exodus. They left for a number of different reasons, economic difficulties, declining Protestantism in the region, the lure of chain migration and a fresh start in a less sectarian environment, financial opportunities, and beneficial emigration policies including specific efforts in Upper Canada after the War of 1812 to populate the colony with loyal settlers. Many of the thousands of Irish immigrants to Upper Canada after 1815 were either discharged yeomanry or former militia, or the sons of those men, 
who used their personal histories of manly service to the crown during the 1798 Irish Rising as the basis for their claim to a just place in British North America. In seeking land grants from the Upper Canadian government, they often noted either their service in the militia during 1798 or that they were among the suffering loyalists of Wexford who had made official claims with the government over lost property and livelihoods during the Rising. These Irish families arrived in a colony that defined itself through loyalty to the Crown and the British Empire. The family compact was the oligarchy that ran Upper Canada in the first four decades of the 19th century. It was made up of United Empire Loyalists, also known as the losers of the American Revolution, who valued imperial loyalty, social respectability, and cultural superiority above all else. Very soon, the family compact found itself at odds with new orange immigrants over which group were the real loyalists in Upper Canada. The Orange Lodge had specific benefits for its members in the colonies. It was a fraternal society that many had known back in Ireland, allowing for something familiar to thrive in a new, unknown homeland. It created a sense of community and helped with acculturation to Canadian society. For Protestants who lived too far from an actual church, the order acted as a religious outlet. It also began to have enough members to make it a political entity, particularly for those who felt the Tories of the family compact and the radical reformers in the province ignored immigrants' concerns. The lodge could fill the loneliness and isolation that were significant parts of the settler experience in relocating from Ireland to rural Upper Canada. That said, and I cannot emphasize this enough, many Protestants from Ireland who had moved to the Canadas wanted nothing to do with the Orange Order. There were many areas in Lower and Upper Canada where the movement never took hold. Some people were disgusted by its blatant sectarianism or its reputation for violence, particularly on the 12th of July and during local elections. Others felt no need to publicly demonstrate any part of their loyalty to the empire. Choosing to live in Canada rather than America already said enough. In the 1830s, an Orangeman was most probably an Irish Protestant. But an Irish Protestant was not necessarily an Orangeman. However, within a few years, Irish Protestantism increasingly and erroneously became associated with the actions of the Orange Order, regardless of whether or not an individual Irishman was a member of the local lodge. The actions of the minority came to define the reputation of the majority. By 1825, Orangism had a firm foothold in the colony, and their numbers continued to grow. However, it lacked central organization and political clout. What did exist in Leeds County was a critical mass of Irish Protestant Orangemen, the Wexford Exodus, living in the concessions along the St. Lawrence River and further up in the backwoods, who were ready to support a leader from the old country. According to historian Harewood Sr., Orangemen in Upper Canada needed someone with enough personal charisma to unite the disparate elements of the order under a single, triumphant banner. Whether they wanted him or not, Ogle Gowan, the son of Hunter Gowan, was to be their man. I like to think of Ogle Gowan as an Irish-Canadian version of Tantalus, the figure from Greek mythology who was punished by the gods with enticing visions of food and drink that he could never quite reach. Similarly, Ogle Gowan always tried, but never quite attained, the social standing or political power he thought he deserved. But he did make things very interesting. Next week, we'll take a deeper dive into Orangism in the 1830s through the frustrated public career and intriguing family secrets of Ogle Gowan. Thanks for listening to The Irish in Canada. The show was researched, written, and narrated by me, Jane McGaughy. This season was edited and mixed by Patrick McMaster and produced by Marion Mulvenna. Our theme music was composed and performed by Kate Bevan Baker, and our logo 
was designed by Claire McCauley. Many thanks to the School of Irish Studies at Concordia University in Montreal, the Canadian Irish Studies Foundation, Le Gouvernement de Québec, and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada for their support. If you like the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us on your favorite podcast app. You can spread the word about the Irish in Canada by following us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Irish Canada Pod. Our website is the Irish in Canada Podcast.ca. That's where you can find show notes for our episodes, including lists of sources and recommendations for further reading. Until next time, Gora Maogif. <laughs>